Hello again everyone and welcome back to the underground. So as we move forward into a sort of colder time of year and as the election season gets closer, um, we thought we would throw together a sort of um, top 10 list of con considerations for uh, civil unrest uh, in urban areas in the winter time. And some of the, th some of the unique considerations that winter and uh, more inclement weather bring. So uh, we're going to go over uh, a list. It's more than 10, but we're going to go over a, a list of, of things that people may not have thought about. So without further ado, let's just jump right on into it. So first up, the very first thing that we have to acknowledge before we talk about anything else is that in the wintertime and in colder inclement climates, people are less likely to riot, right? You know, the, the sentence, uh, if someone were to say uh, the sentence, you know, people don't riot when they're six feet of snow on the ground, you know, that's not an untrue statement. Um, it makes it so much more difficult to riot and, and um, commit violent acts in mass in uh, the wintertime. And as we know, a lot of the more, you know, severe riots, you know, Minneapolis, New York City, um, uh, so Chicago, Detroit, some of those more uh, heavily urbanized areas, um, they get quite a bit of snow and quite a bit of winter weather. Now, granted, uh, in the wintertime, your cities like, you know, Florida, any city in Florida, even Atlanta, you know, which has been known for rioting as well, um, and, you know, Southern California, Los Angeles, that's, those areas are not going to be uh, impacted as much because, you know, it doesn't really get that cold in the wintertime. But we do have to remember that in these northern cities, uh, some of these northern latitudes, they're going to get a lot of inclement weather, and it's going to uh, present a lot of challenges, not just for rioters, but also for um, people like us who are trying to just survive through the rioting, right? Now, that being said, um, people being less likely to riot, that does not mean that there won't be riots. It just means that the people who will be out rioting in the six feet of snow will be your dedicated, hardcore, um, I hesitate to use the word, you know, elite rioters, but that's essentially what it is. You're more dedicated followers. You're more dedicated people who are dedicated to violence and looting and rioting and things like that. So if somebody or a group is out rioting in, you know, a lot of ice and snow and, and colder weather, they, they mean business. So... Um, but, you know, just just keep that in mind that, you know, while people are less likely to ride in the wintertime and in snow and things like that, it's not a complete, um, it doesn't mean there's going to be a complete absence of rioting. So up next, one of the most significant factors is fewer hours of daylight. Um, fewer da hours of daylight is, has, is a double-edged sword, right? So basically, when we look at some of the riots that have occurred, such as Minneapolis, the one that started all of this, the riots, the, really the riots started in earnest at around sunset or around, you know, shortly after sunset, right? Or maybe even shortly before on the following days. But we do have to remember what time sunset was. You know, sunset was at or around, you know, rush hour time. So, uh, in, in a lot of cases, falling after rush hour because the sun set, you know, after people had gotten home for the day. As we start getting into the winter months, our days get shorter and our night, our hours of darkness get longer, meaning our sunset comes earlier, you know, obviously. This means that your sunset might be before um, rush hour in a lot of areas. Well, what does that mean? That means that a lot of people in these heavily urbanized areas... You know, instead of getting home, turning on the TV and finding out, oh, hey, there was there's a riot downtown. They're going to be finding out about this at while they're still at work. And um, so you're going to have a lot of people that, that rush of traffic, uh, you know, during rush hour. And in some of these major cities, it really isn't a rush hour anymore. It's just like a, a three to four hour period of increased um, traffic. So uh, we do have to remember that. Uh, some of these more heavily urbanized areas are going to have a lot of people, you know, sort of trapped at work, or that the traffic is going to get a lot worse. And and yet, as a theme you'll see going on throughout the rest of these sort of considerations, is that they tend to compound on one another. For instance, less, you know, fewer, fewer hours of daylight also means your solar panels are not going to be able to be as effective as they were in the summertime, meaning you're going, to, you're going to have fewer hours of daylight. So for us at our latitude here in Virginia, that gets cut in half. So 
um, yeah, the fewer hours of daylight, it, it means, means a lot of things. It means that a lot of these, you know, crimes and riots are going to have a lot more darkness to play with, a lot more operating hours, right? That's something that cannot be underestimated, um, as we move forward into this winter season. Up next, and this was a, this is a big one, and it is, um, the prevalence and difficulty of fighting fires in an urban environment in the winter time. So I think that fire preparedness is one of those things that people tend to discount or they don't exactly know how severe it can be. Uh, basically, fighting fires is hard enough in the summertime, but fighting fires in the urban, and urban landscape in the wintertime is, makes everything infinitely harder. You know, pipes and hoses freeze, which means that you're going to have to drag hose a lot further. You're going to have to keep hoses, you know, keep water moving through hoses, which creates ice. You know, you also have to remember that during the wintertime, people use space heaters and other flammable heat sources. So your risk for having a fire uh, spread throughout a city goes up anyway, and that's not even with a riot, right? You also have to remember that firefighters' endurance is also affected as well. It is a lot harder to um, carry some of this equipment and, and operate in a, in a winter environment because it's just so much more difficult. Um, you also have to remember that you know traffic is affected as well from you know snow drifts. So fire trucks and and uh, other first responder type agencies are going to have a harder and longer response time. Um, structures are also more prone to collapse from the weight of snow and ice. So for instance, you know, fighting a fire, if you've got, you know, three or four feet piled up on the roof of a building, well, that's a collapse hazard right there. So it's another, yet another thing to slow down the firefighting process. You also have to remember that snow and, and ice also, um, change the geographic landscape, meaning, you know, snow hides swimming pools. So... When you're walking around on the ground and you don't know there's a swimming pool there, you could walk in and, and suddenly, you know, you're you're uh, you're in trouble if you're a firefighter. So, you know, s snow hides things like pools, you know, stairs, drop-offs, embankments, and and everything is suddenly an, an entrapment hazard, which it wasn't before before the snow fell. So, there are a lot of hazards to fighting fires in the winter time, which once again slows down uh, operations. So. It's almost, you know, a recurring theme, like I said, is things compounding on one another. And, you know, it's just one of the paradoxes of this is kind of like a spinoff of, you know, Murphy's Law, which is that, you know, the harder and the more, uh, the harder the situation is and the, the more desperately you need something, the harder it is to get. So this is definitely the case with firefighting. The, the more you need a firefighter and your firefighting entity to be, to get to your location, the harder it is going to be for them to do so. It's just one of those things that tends to happen. Up next are considerations for personal defense. And this one's kind of a longer list because um, I don't think people quite take into consideration a lot of the, 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 the winter warfare uh, type things that, that go into a, a, a uh, even not, not even just like an alpine or a snow environment such as uh, you know on the slide here but really even something that's just moderately cold uh, these things can affect you know weapons personnel all kinds of things in very very interesting ways um, so you know first off how many people out there can you know accurately and quickly and reliably fire their weapon while wearing gloves, you know, winter, heavy winter gloves, you know. So that's one, of, you know, one thing that not a whole lot of people, I, I haven't seen anybody practicing that at the range, and yet, you know, we get a decent amount of snow here every year, and it's, it's certainly cold outside, and we all wear winter gloves here in Virginia in the wintertime, even though it's not as you know, cold as like Michigan or Maine or something like that. Uh, it still gets pretty chilly here, and, you know, if you're concealed carrying, can you draw and reliably, accurately, and, uh, and um, easily engage a target while wearing gloves? So that's another consideration people don't quite um, think about. Another thing that people don't quite think about is just the whole concept of 
um, sort of aftermarket parts and and um, these cool Gucci add-ons to their carry weapons and really all you know any of their weapons. You know, we, we of course are you know guilty of this as well. You know, everybody likes a cool looking you know weapon system, but how many of those weapon, how many of those cool weapons accessories were made with cold weather in mind? You know, you know, I, I don't, I'm not sure of any sort of AR pistol stock that is, or pistol, sorry, pistol brace. I don't know of any sort of AR pistol brace that is made and uh, tested to extreme cold weather standards, whereas the normal, you know, normal M4 weapons stock is right. So um, it's something to keep in mind. Um, that you may not, even though granted, you know, mil spec isn't certainly not a uh, metric for any sort of quality. It does indicate, in some cases, that certain testing was done on certain things, um, whereas the civilian market may not have that problem, right? Another th issue that we see a lot of people not really take into account is wearing body armor on top of their winter clothing. So. A lot of people are, you know, into wearing plate carriers and things like that. But you know, even in the military, we see the problem of of people wearing um, uh, body armor on top of their winter clothing, and that body armor is, you know, sitting now instead of sitting flush up against your skin, it's now an inch or even two inches in some cases uh, away from your body. So the further your body armor is away from your body, the less area it covers. So you might have, you know, some things to do with that. So, you know, make sure that you can actually wear your body armor effectively over your winter clothing. Because as we all know, the Gucci thing to do nowadays is to have smaller and smaller sized plates. Um, another thing is, you know, physical fitness. Like in, in the cold and in the, in the rain and in the snow and in the, the sludge and the mud, you know, how far can you run? What are your physical standards, right? You know, it's hard enough. To run uh, oh, with a with a heavy load on a, on flat ground, you know, carrying something heavy, that's hard enough as is, and it becomes exponentially harder when you're trying to do that uh, in the snow. You, I mean, running in the snow is just torture in some cases, right? Depending on how deep the snow is, and then not to mention the fact if try running on black ice, guess what? You're just gonna hurt yourself. <laughs> so. Uh, you know, that's another consideration as well, is that we have to realize that our transit times, if we're trying to go somewhere on foot, might heavily be infected, you know, uh, affected. And sort of getting back to the, to the personal gear type thing, we have to remember that a lot of, you know, weapons uh, type lubricants don't necessarily work that well in the cold as well. And a lot of people haven't quite thought of this because, let's face it, you know, if, if anybody's going to carry a gun... Uh, most people who carry guns outside their home do so concealed in America, right? And when you have a concealed pistol or something like that, it's up against your body. So your your body heat is keeping it warm. Okay, well, what about if you have to go outside with a rifle now? Now, your rifle is outside. It's outside your clothing, and it is, you know, definitely um, more, uh, more susceptible to cold than, say, your concealed carry pistol. So, you know, a lot of people, you know, use stuff like... Um, like natural like cleaners and CLP, sort of like frog lube. And, um, you know, despite the fact that there's, a, you know, of course your YouTube backyard scientists out there, um, but just us personally, we haven't really had any good uh, experiences using frog lube in the cold weather, especially if, you, if your uh, weapon system likes to have a lot of lubrication. Frog lube just ends up freezing and sticking, whereas other types of uh, weapons lubricant uh, are perfectly fine, but you wouldn't know this unless you uh, actually are, um, you know, training in the cold, which not a lot of people have the opportunity to do. And then we also have to remember things like if you have an optic on your weapon, guess what? You know, cold temperature dramatically affect battery life. You know, not so much with your lithiums, right, your lithium batteries, but if you're using like rechargeable batteries or some kind of oddball battery, or like an aim point battery, which is like a, you know, 2032 battery, a little watch battery, you know, your, your, um, your uh, battery life is going to get impacted severely, especially with things like nods, because uh, a lot of nods nowadays are, are running off of double A's, and which is great because every, you know, double A's are so common, but double A's, if they're not lithium, you know, if they're like a rechargeable double A, they're going to have a severely shortened um, battery lifetime, and it's significant. It's sometimes upwards of 50%, we've just noticed with our own, uh, own devices and things. 
and then of course you know your flashlights as well so um, that's sort of you know a consideration uh, moving forward with you know how, how many batteries you're going to carry with you and where you're going to store them right another thing that people don't quite think about in this personal defense category is the sort of crash or the bump in the night preparedness right so I think that everybody or a, a, a large portion of people out there who listen to our podcast are have thought about or and are you know pretty pretty well prepared for the bump in the night. Well, what happens if that bump in the night is a riot outside your house and it's you know 17 degrees below zero outside? You know, do, are you going to be able to grab your grab your go kit, grab your bag, egress from the area, and because I'm pretty sure everybody doesn't sleep in winter clothing. Are you going to have winter clothing in your uh, egress system? Are you going to have win good winter boots, good socks, and things to change your clothes in if you get wet? You know that's a huge consideration, and we'll move into that when we when we talk about other stuff. Um, but you also have to uh, think about can you fit your winter you know winter gear in your go bag? Like uh, I, one of our guys here, uh, he he rocks his bag, and uh, he cannot fit his sleep system inside his bag. He has to strap it to the outside. But his summer one, his summer system, uh, fits inside the bag. Uh, but the winter system doesn't because it's such a, a bulky bag. And, you know, it's, a, it's quite a consideration considering how much bulk a lot of this winter-type gear has. Another thing to consider is the, the nature of, of some kind of conflict at night. The winter landscape provides a lot of different things. Uh, one of the things that is, is, pertains to warfare specifically is sound. So sound over uh, well-crusted snow, uh, where it's you know had a chance to settle down, freshly fallen snow tends to absorb sound a lot of times. But snow that's been there for a while, old snow that's crusted over, frozen, uh, melted and refrozen, that snow sound tends to carry pretty well over that, much further away than uh, on normal standard uh, dirt or grass or some kind of other uh, terrain. So that's a consideration if you're trying to you know, listen for activity that's coming from a long way away. Or if you yourself are trying to uh, move about without being detected as the sound carries a long, a long way. You also have to remember that uh, snow is obviously white. And if you've got a full moon out there, well, guess what? Moving around at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning is going to be pretty hard to do if there's a full moon because it's going to be like daylight because that sunlight is going to reflect all that light. So if you're trying to move tactically, secure your property, do whatever you got to do, remember it's going to be a lot harder to do in the snow. Plus, I'm not sure of very many people, uh, even people who live in, in um, uh, uh, more alpine type environments, I'm pretty not very sure how many people have uh, winter type camouflage. So, you know, it's we've got to start thinking about these these things that the military has been thinking about for a long time like what like I mentioned with their uh, mountain warfare schools another consideration for the in the personal defense category is uh, wounded uh, wounded personnel so if you get injured if you slip and fall on some black ice or something which is likely to happen uh, or you know God forbid somebody gets shot or injured and you know critically injured in some way well, guess what? It's going to be a lot harder to evacuate you because uh, it's going to be harder to create things like uh, HLZs, helicopter landing zones. It's going to be harder to to get you, you know, out of that area, right? So, you know, the old adage of you know, once again, the more you need it, the harder and more impossible it will be to get comes into play. So, um, you know, medevacs and 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 things like that are a huge, huge consideration for for something like that. So, um, you know, coming back to the topic, because I forgot to mention it with the, uh, the, the snow light being bright and reflecting light, that also um, enhances people's night vision that don't have nods. So, for instance, on a moonless night uh, with, with no snow on the ground and uh, with no uh, city lights in, in the distance, like, you know, even you know somebody like me with nods is going to struggle to get a good picture of what's going on. And somebody without nods in that situ in that scenario is going to be totally blind. Like they're not going to be able to see their hand in front of their face. And you start adding things in, like you know, a little bit of moon illumination, a little bit of, of uh, starlight, things like that. You're going to start adding that back in, and, and and suddenly, you know, my nods are working at their peak efficiency, 
and you know maybe a human being can have some level of night vision. Well, if you add in snow to that factor, guess what? You are greatly reducing. You're greatly reducing the barrier and, and the sort of disparity between uh, somebody with nods and somebody without nods. So. Um, and this could be a good thing or a bad thing. If you don't have nods, guess what? You're going to be able to see a lot better uh, in the winter time where there's snow on the ground and when there's ice on the ground. Well, mostly snow. Um, but if you have nods, guess what? Everybody that doesn't have nods can now see you better, and your uh, capabilities aren't increased that that much at all. Um, so that's a huge concern because it, it, so the snow uh, levels the playing field a lot between people who have nods and people who don't. So. Um, that's a huge uh, consideration for personal defense. And I know this was a kind of a big category, so we split it up into uh, the next category, which is um, a perimeter defense. So w one has to remember that with snow and ice on the ground, you know, all of your security cameras, all of your, your, your uh, motion sensors, motion detectors for lights and things, they can become obscured by um, uh, snow. They can also be, you know, water can get inside them and, and, and freeze them and uh, the glass that's usually pretty cheap because security cameras in America are usually made in China so they're all pretty cheap quality. They can frost over pretty easily and things like that so um, your defenses can be easily hampered or, or hindered by um, uh, snow and things like that. You also have to um, consider things like, you know, doors and locks, you know, sticking or freezing shut. Um, and, and which can create an, an entrapment hazard. So I, I know that even here in uh, Virginia, this happens uh, about maybe once a year or so. Uh, and during the coldest part of the year, uh, we'll have you know sticky locks. Well, our our car doors will, will be frozen shut or something like that. Maybe our back doors got a little sticky. Um, but hey, if there was an emergency, guess what? That sticky lock, it, you know, that's a, a normally not a big issue, suddenly becomes a big issue. So. Um, Snow and ice, and well, really just mostly snow. This is from your more northern areas, but snow um, piled up, you know, can also allow people to get over obstructions like fences and even things like concertina wire. You put concertina wire down on the ground, you know, and which is, you know, about 18 to 24 inches in diameter, and you get a couple feet of snow, guess what? You could, you could walk uh, pretty much on top of that if it's compacted down enough. Um, you could walk on top of that and not be uh, bothered by it at all. So, you know, snow drifts love to congregate up against houses and fences, and those can easily be used to step up and over um, should a riot head your way. Um, the sort of uh, traditional uh, defense methods of, you know, going out to, you know, check your property and things like that, those become hindered as well. Because um, let's not forget that, you know, during, in our own experiences, when we had our own riots locally, um, we had one of our guys had to, um, he basically turned off his air conditioner, uh, opened up all the windows in his house, and I uh, was very quiet for several hours. That way, you know, this is one of the things we did so that we were able to hear what was going on. Because, you know, an air conditioner, for those of you that don't know, is quite loud. And if you shut your air conditioner off and open up your windows, if the, the climate is um, uh, permissive to this, you can uh, hear uh, protesting and rioting from a long way off. So that was a huge force multiplier, just being able to do something as simple as that. Well, that might not be possible in the wintertime if it's, you know, you know, 30, 30 below out there. You might not be able to open up, you know, your windows and things like that because it's just simply too cold to do so. So that's something to, to definitely keep in mind. And then going on uh, to the next topic, which is uh, not really a, a sort of, you know, combat defense type topic, is uh, the food supply. So ordinarily, um, food supplies are usually impacted, impacted in the wintertime, though usually not severely. You might have the occasional grocery store tractor trailer flip over like this one, um, but you know, combined with rioting and, shortage and, and, and food shortages in the winter, um, these impacts will be made infinitely worse you know, by bad weather. So um, you know, we, we also have to remember that, that colder weather results in people tending to consume more calories, right? Um, we all know people, even our, even our, us ourselves, you know, put on a few extra pounds in the wintertime. 
um, which is a combination of you know rich type holiday foods and you know a sedentary lifestyle, not people not getting outside to to um, to work out and things like that. So you, we have to remember though that during the winter time is naturally just throughout the history of humanity, winter time has been uh, the time where food sh- where food shortages are most likely to occur anyway. Right? We've all heard even you know nursery r- nursery rhymes and children's stories talk about you know the you know stocking things up and saving things up for winter, saving things up for a rainy day, right? Um, so just just naturally what happens and you combine that with the fact that we already have food shortages due to the the sort of covid crisis and uh, combined with rioting it's just a it's just a, a perfect storm of vulnerability right there with our food supply so you know uh, there are a lot of people out there that are already saying that hey we're gonna have a huge food shortage I don't, I, you know we can't say if that's true or not but hey it doesn't hurt to prepare for it um, because we've shown we've shown that it is possible um, you know, and especially considering that in the winter time, it's a lot harder and it almost impossible to grow food in a lot of different areas. So, you know, even for us, even like right now, um, and you know, come as we come to the end of September, we're you know, our own personal little gardens are um, it's starting to get a little chilly. Um, so we're having to you know make preparations for our you know winter crops, which is something that. Um, it just takes a lot more money to do. It takes, you have to run power out there. You have to have heating elements in a lot of cases. If your stuff's outside, you know, protecting things from the elements. You can only grow certain crops and things like that. So, you know, once again, just yet another dimension to the whole perfect storm of vulnerability with the food supply. And then moving on to the next one, which is kind of, which is directly tied to this one, is the water supply. You know, um, you know, as as one might expect, you know, water is also a huge consideration in the winter time, because as we kind of touched on it with the fire scenario, pipes burst, pipes burst, and and things happen not just with you know your own residential type water setups, but with the city as well, and, and you know municipal uh, water supplies. So, you know, pipes bursting are sort of a mainstay of of winter, you know, winter weather. You know, if you've ever I remember growing up. If you've ever lived in a house where you um, where you have a, a sort of water pump, a, a pumping station, a little uh, water pump outside, it's got a, a little you know a little hut over it, or in a lot of cases people put fake rocks over them, right? You know, I guarantee you, if you have one of those, um, you've put a, a, a light bulb or some kind of heating element out there around those pipes, and uh, it's just so that the pump itself and you know the, the uh, the pipes don't freeze and burst. You know, I can remember doing that. I think probably every year um, I've, I've had to do that. That I wasn't living on city water or something like that. Um, but yeah, what, what are you going to do if you don't have power, though? You know, <laughs> so do you have a way to keep your pipes from bursting without using some kind of power? And I know a lot of people don't have that. Uh, don't have that luxury, right? So um, we have to remember that electricity is a huge one as well, which is what you know sort of directly segues into our next category, which is power outages. You know, just like I mentioned, you know, power outages are already extremely common in the winter time in a lot of areas. You know, even areas where uh, winter weather is not necessarily a a, pr- a a huge problem. So, for instance, you know, one of the one of the things that you'll that the people will notice who've lived in different you know climates around the United States is that you know you live up north and you know you get three feet of snow on the ground, everything's fine. It's a normal. It's like a Tuesday, right? But you know, down in Virginia or in Texas or in, you know, occasionally in like northern New Mexico or some you know states like that, which aren't really known for getting snow, if they get like a freak you know blizzard come through. And they get like maybe a quarter of an inch of ice, not even snow, just quarter of an inch of an ice or something like that. The whole state will shut down. You know, that people have no idea how to drive because they're not used to it. You're you're, you're going to have instead of one or two power lines coming down, you're going to have a whole city down, and it's because they just don't get that you know thing. So you, you they don't get that much snow uh, every year. So. You know, even though you'd think that some of the bigger risk comes from the areas like in the northern states where they do get a lot of snow, uh, actually, from what we've seen is that there's still a lot of, it, it may not be most risk, but you still get a lot of risk and a lot of bad things and unfortunate things happen in, in states and in areas which 
aren't known for snow, but may get that one occasional storm. And, you know, what if that one occasional storm was during a riot, right? And, you know, bringing the rioter element into this, if, you know, if rioters or other more serious malign actors like actual domestic terrorists and not just like unorganized rioters, um, if they were to capitalize on, you know, naturally occurring power outages, uh, we could see citywide blackouts that last for a long time. And uh, it's not that hard to uh, impact the power grid, and it's only a matter of time before these people figure it out. And, you know, once again, bringing back the theme of, hey, everything compounds on something else. You know, without power to electrically heat homes, you know, more people will rely on more hazardous forms of heating, which exponentially raises the risk of residential fire. So, you know, your power goes out and people get cold and they start, you know, burning things or using, you know, oil or kerosene space heaters and, you know, propane and start using their gas stove. And then suddenly you've got, you know, risk of gas explosions. You've got risk of carbon monoxide poisoning from your neighbors. You've got a lot, you've got a lot of stuff, risk that piles up just because of a power outage. So, um, you know... You, you also have to remember that power being out also means that most security systems will be down as well. You know, same thing with, you know, your security lighting and things like that. Unless you have, like, battery-powered uh, lights, which are fairly common, but there's nobody out there that I know of that has battery-powered security cameras unless it's a dedicated system. And even then, it's only, a, a like, a, a UPS so that it can safely shut down. I don't, I don't know of any system that's a residential system that has a whole bank of batteries to keep it going when the power goes out. Um, that might be something to look into. Uh, but, you know, this, of course, increases the risk of damage and, you know, looting and rioting and, and just general theft. Um, it just increases the risk uh, exponentially, right? And then moving on to the next one, this is kind of a, a different topic. Uh, the, the, one of the uh, a big consideration is complacency. Um, we tend to underestimate the impacts that you know normal winter weather has on uh, operations. You know, we just tend to underestimate that. No, that's not even counting the rioting and protesting and things. You know, as such, we drastically underestimate the impact of rioting and bad weather. Uh, that those two will have when combined together, right? And it's something that's very um, hard to predict. I can say the only really good thing about you know the weather is that it's it's universal and it's random in its impacts, right? Everybody's affected pretty much equally and also randomly. We don't know exactly how much snow is going to fall. We don't know how much ice is going to fall or how much damage it's going to do until it happens. So. By default, the people that are more prepared before bad weather will have an advantage over those who aren't prepared. So, you know, one of the things that that is uh, perhaps a good thing is um, the lack of preparation on the rioters' part. For instance, just looking at some of the riots and the and the more violent um, uh, demonstrations around the U.S. The people that are doing them aren't exactly preparedness-minded. So I doubt, I highly doubt, that you're going to have hundreds of rioters in the streets all with, you know, layered clothing, waterproof boots, changing their socks every half an hour. Um, you're just, they're just not going to do that, right? So you, they're, they're not going to be prepared for winter weather. They're barely going to be hanging on just being outside, whereas... Um, People like police, uh, military, and more, uh, more conscientious and and prepared uh, type people will be able to be comfortable outside. So, you know, we have to factor that in as well. Is that these riders are no, they're not going to be even if they're going to go out and ride in cold weather, they're not going to be truly prepared for cold weather. They're not going to be hydrating like we all know is a huge thing with cold weather. You need to hydrate almost more than in warm weather because you're going to be sweating a lot. They're not going to be removing layers when they do start to sweat. All these other traditional winter weather basics that we all know. The riders, they're not just not that personality type. So uh, moving on to the next one is communications. And this is a big one. Um, so as one might expect, power outages, like I just mentioned, affect communications greatly, you know, obviously. But when combined with rioting and civil unrest, the, the impacts are amplified, uh, you know, like everything else we've talked about so far. 
you know, a, a, if you have sort of uh, a unique setup, which is becoming popular now, which are attic antennas, you've got to remember that if you've got a, a foot or two of snow on your roof, um, that's definitely going to reduce the range of, you know, attic-based antennas. And if you have an outside antenna like the one here on the slide, guess what? You get even just a small amount of ice build up on it. It's going to bend and break. Um, so you have to remember that, you know, that the weather definitely impacts your anten an antennas. You know, from, you know, we also have to remember that the technology itself is vulnerable. You know, from ham radios to cell phones, it is rare to find a communications method that is truly weatherproof. Um, you know, connections get wet and freeze. You know, antennas collapse and break under the weight of ice. And, you know, cold temperatures impact electronics of all kinds. And just like I mentioned, battery life as well. You know, as such, at a time where communications are most needed, you know, during a time of unrest and rioting and during, you know, inclement weather, is exactly when communications of all types are the most vulnerable. You know, after all, if your communications plan works when things are, you know, just peachy outside, it doesn't really matter that much. But if your communications, you know, fail when things are going badly, that can and most likely will have a severe impact on, you know, your situation. So I think that we cannot underestimate the power of communications. Um, so uh, another thing that... Uh, isn't, isn't impacting uh, communications that are things like um, uh, transportation, which is our next topic. So uh, this is kind of indirectly related to communications because in a lot of times, you know, the, the old fashioned uh, runner, you know, messenger is your classic um, and timeless way of communicating. And in a lot of times where if your cell towers are down, your radio is not working because of the snow and things like that, um, you're, you know, this is going to be being able to move from one area to another with a person is going to be crucial. And if your roads are shut down too, well, now you've just eliminated your last most reliable form of communication if that's part of your comm plan. But one thing to, to remember in this sort of category that goes along with communications is tracks. You know, tracks are left behind in snow, right? Whether you're driving or, or walking, right? So if you're trying to covertly move somewhere, it's going to be next to impossible to do on you know fresh snow uh, with fresh snow on the ground if it hasn't been filled in by you know more. You can move during snowfall; it's fine. The, snack, the tracks will be covered up uh, pretty easily. But if it's just snowed and it stops snowing, guess what? You're going to leave a huge trail. And this matters for communications because what if you're trying to go out? What if you've got a covert antenna outside? One of the big things in the ham radio community is covert antennas, right? Being able to put up an antenna somewhere where your, maybe your HOA doesn't approve of you having a ham radio antenna, or maybe um, you don't want you know, some kind of federal agency to determine, to figure out you're using a radio antenna or, or have some kind of communications method like that. So covert antennas are popular. We use them all the time. But the point is, is that if you have to go out there and service that antenna and get the ice and stuff off of it and check the connections and, and, and dry out the connections, well, you're just gonna, you're gonna lead people right to it if you're walking through snow. So that's another huge consideration as well. Um, we also have to remember that, um, you know, just like I mentioned earlier, winter weather in your, in your bug out bags and your go bags or whatever you want to call them, um, the, the kit you carry, even the stuff you just take to work every day, if you're going to carry winter gear in them, just like I mentioned, it's going to get bulky and it's going to get a little heavier. Um, but another thing is, is how you pack your, your bug out bag as well. You know, for instance, it's not just as simple as taking out your summer sleep system, putting in your winter and putting in your winter sleep system, or taking out, you know, your mosquito netting and putting in an extra thermal layer. It's not quite as simple as that because there's, and, and this is up for debate. So just take it for what you will. But I, you know, I just me personally, what I do is during the summertime, I have things, the heavier things in my bag, higher up, and closer to your back, like the classic backpacking trick that everybody's talked about for a long time. Um, so if you've got a, something really heavy like water, it goes up right up next to my back, as high in my pack as I possibly can can make it. It just makes it a lot easier on me and it allows the load to be transferred more efficiently to me personally. Now in the winter time that changes. In the winter time I put my heavy stuff at the very bottom of my pack as close to my body as possible. 
That's because I want the center of gravity for my body to be lower. So if I'm using skis or snowshoes or something like that, I can actually uh, have a better center of gravity, better balance and things like that over uneven terrain or, you know, like I said, with skis. Um, so that's something to, uh, something to factor in as well if you're in that sort of environment. Even if you're not in an environment where you actually have skis or something like that, you know, I still do it because things get slippery out there. Even in the mid-Atlantic, even as far down as, you know, the south and, you know, the, 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 the west, um, you know, out west, it gets, it gets pretty cold out there. And you might have some black ice and things like that. So that's what I tend to do in the wintertime. So it's not just what you pack, but it's how you pack it changes in the wintertime as well. And also in the transportation method, uh, transportation category, we have to remember that snow, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, sort, of, sort of alluded to, uh, snow fills in things like ditches. You know, it makes it very uh, likely for you know you to actually accidentally drive off of the road surface and into a ditch, and then that, of course, once again compounds uh, by making it very difficult for you to get your vehicle out of the ditch in the winter time. So. You know, and then guess what? You know, if that happens, you're stranded in the cold, uh, in an inclement uh, situation where your vehicle is stuck, and now, now the situation has just gotten um, quite severely worse. So, moving on to the next topic, this uh, another thing that people tend to discount, not just in the uh, winter time, but this is also a summertime thing as well. But is the morale and you know the mental impact that weather can have. Um, you know, being cold and wet is miserable. I don't care what culture you are, where you grew up or, or whatever, you know, unless you grew up in the, you know, remote regions of Siberia, you're going to, human beings have a pre, uh, a, a preconceived, um, a predetermination to being cold and wet. It's just miserable, right? It doesn't matter where you're from. You know, and it's even more miserable if the reason that you're in, you know, the reason that you're cold and wet is because you've got to stand outside or stand watch and make sure that people don't destroy your stuff, right? So that's, you know, you're already in an angsty situation where you're emotionally invested in something and now you're cold and wet. You see how that affects morale? It makes you feel pretty bad or it changes your mentality in ways that you, you know, are situation dependent, but... Um, you know, in cold weather, we also have to remember not not just you know mental capacity um, of of being you know you know uh, sour at the cold weather, but um, your mental capacity is directly uh, harmed as well. Um, in cold weather, even the simplest of tasks, things you've done your entire life, require considerable considerable brain power. Just like I said, in, in cold weather, even the simplest of tasks it requires a lot of brain power and requires a lot of dexterity, which is impacted immediately uh, as soon as you step into a cold weather situation and is made worse the longer you're in that situation. So, you know, we also have to worry about things in the wintertime of long-term issues like trench foot or immersion foot or, or other cold weather maladies, you know, dehydration, even hyperthermia, hyperthermia where you get too hot, whereas, you know, when somebody's um, uh, next to, uh, you know, next to a fire on that line, they get too hot. So um, that's something to, uh, to, to factor in as well, something that we can't quite uh, uh, overlook. And then finally, our last topic, which is perhaps the most uh, most uh, unfortunate one, is things like uh, CBRN concerns, C-burn, c, -burn, c um, Basically, you, riots are going to continue, and um, law enforcement agencies around the U.S. are continuing to use tear gas like it's going out of style. Tear gas, riot control agents, pepper spray, you name it, it's being used. And, you know, however you feel about that, the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of innocent, a lot of innocent bystanders have the, have the capacity to be hit or impacted by these things. Um, we ourselves have been close enough to rioting, of course not partaking in it, just riots happening near our house. And we've even felt that familiar sting of tear gas, you know, just standing on our own, uh, standing on our own property. So, um... It's, you know, things get, things get real close and, you know, just imagine, um, you know, sitting at mop level, you know, infinity, right, where you're literally got all your mop stuff on, you're, you're way more stuff than's probably necessary in the freezing rain, in the dark, you know, with spotty comms because the power is out, 
you know, and a gun that may or may not jam because it's cold and it's kind of sticky. And, you know, with a fire on the next street over, you know, and rioters right there at your front door. You know, you see how all of this compounds together? I think that's probably the the the, the theme for today is that wintertime is miserable uh, for operations like this. And unless you're a military unit, which has spent decades training and, and trying to impact and, and uh, not just survive, but actually be an asset during a winter condition... You know, a lot of civilians, especially us, are not going to be able to. Um, we're, we're not going to be able to be quite the level of the asset that we hope to be. Um, but we can still plan and uh, hope to not be a liability, and that's sort of the goal out there. So, as we move into uh, finishing up here today, I hope this has been helpful. Um, these are just some of the things that we've kind of been uh, working around. We've all kind of pitched in two or three of these ideas of, hey, you know, what are some of the considerations for wintertime warfare and, and wintertime you know riding because in a lot of cities they look just like this it's it's a it's a war zone out there in a lot of these situations and um while you know like i mentioned in the very beginning it did you know winter weather does mean the riding is probably going to quiet down but this riots that do survive are probably going to be pretty severe so hopefully this helps trigger some ideas as people who have uh, been listening to us for a while now know uh, really all our businesses is triggering ideas and providing some good information that can help save some lives out there. And that's certainly what we hope to uh, accomplish today. So that's all we have for today. And as usual, make sure you go check out our other platforms. We have you know, uh, some, some uh, social media sites out there. If you guys still got Instagram up, we've got our website. Teespring, if you want to support us that way. Um, if you're listening to us on YouTube, uh, we have, a, we have a, a podcast, if you didn't know already. And if you're listening to us on the podcast, we also have a YouTube channel, which we have basically mutual content on both of those platforms. We're trying to spread out as much as possible. Um, but we do have, we host different things on, on different platforms, so make sure you check all of our stuff out. We also have our uh, Keybase server, where we do you know, live updates from time to time. And uh, you'll you'll be able to hit us up there if you have any questions. You know, also our emails and things like that are also uh, linked below. So um, hopefully that has helped been helpful once again. And um, we'll be coming back at you with another episode talking about more preparedness for the upcoming um, sort of insanity that the election season is going to bring on us um, very soon. So so hopefully we'll not only be able to fight in the shade, but also fight in the darkness as we get closer into the winter time. So. Uh, hopefully we'll see you all guys next time and as to actual out.